lecture. For this week, we will be dealing with module 3. Module 3 will be about the laboratory safety and infection. A few reminder before you start watching the video lecture number 1, please do take down notes. A soft copy or a PDF file has been provided to you already in your smart kits. Listen attentively, avoid unnecessary distractions. For a uh, third one, Give extra attention to information marked with a star because, again, if it will be a star in anywhere in the presentation, it may be a recall question in the board exam. And please do take note of this as well. This module, module 3, will also be the first topic for PMLS2 laboratory. So the first two, the module 1 and module 2, and also module 3, is for lecture. However, for the laboratory, ito po yung pinakauna nating topic. Module 3. Okay? So, fusion na siya. Dito po sa ating Module 3. These are our learning objectives for today. Describe the components of the chain of infection. Define nosocomial and health care related or associated infections. Describe standard precautions. Discuss the transmission prevention procedures in the laboratory. Describe the transmission-based precautions. Discuss what is the difference of isolation from reverse isolation. Describe the general rules for safe handling of chemicals. Discuss electrical safety and the procedure to follow in cases of electrical shock. Describe the general precautions that phlebotomists should observe for physical hazards. Define the acronyms RACE and PASS for fire or explosive hazards. Okay, so let's start. There are various different hazards that can be encountered in the laboratory. It can either be biological, chemical, and many other. And we will define each of these. First, we have your biological hazard. Under biological hazard, we will be dealing with the six components of the chain of infection. So, ma'am, ano po itong chain of infection na to? Ito po yung kumbaga parang life cycle ng mga diseases natin. At sino-sino yung mga uh, contributors niya. Okay? So, yun po yung chain. Di ba mo siyang chain, no? Itong uh, pabilog na to. So, what are the six components of the chain of infection? Number one. Infectious agents such as COVID-19. So, COVID-19, right, is a virus. So, that is an example of an infectious agent. We also have your reservoir. Yung reservoir, nandun yung term niya na reserve. Kumbaga, itong mga reservoir na to, reservoir host or those uh, individuals that can be a source of potential infection as well. So, that is reservoir. We also have the portal of exit. So, a good example of this is, kunwari yung mga reservoir host natin, infected sila with the infectious agent. Lalabas sa katawan nila ngayon yung virus, kunwari si COVID. Lalabas, portal of exit. So, nung lumabas si virus sa katawan ng ating mga reservoir, kakalat ngayon yung virus. Example nga yan, si COVID-19. After the portal of exit in the reservoir host, we now have the mode of transmission. Kasi diba, lumabas na sa katawan yung virus. Ngayon, magta-transmit na siya. A good example, infectious agent, COVID, ang main mode of transmission niya is inhalation of respiratory droplets. Okay, so yan, yeah, nag-transmit ngayon yung virus. Next yan, after the mode of transmission is the portal of entry. So, papasok naman po siya ngayon dun sa ating susceptible host. Okay, and then the cycle just so, the, this is the six main component of the chain of infection. But ma'am, ano nga ba po ang infection? According to the CDC, an infection occurs when the germs enter the body, increase in number, and causes a reaction of the body. So, that is the definition of an infection according to the CDC. And in relation to the infection definition, we now also have the term nosocomial infection. Mom, what is nosocomial infection? That is an infection acquired by a patient during a hospital stay. I repeat, nosocomial infection are those infection acquired by a patient during a hospital stay. 
So, kumbaga, sa ospital niya po nakuha yung sakit. Okay? That is known as nosocomial infection. And please do take note that there is a recall question here. What is the number one cause of nosocomial infection? That is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I repeat, the number one cause of nosocomial infection is a bacteria known as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Ito po yung itsura ng bacteria na yan. And then aside from the nosocomial infection, we also have a healthcare acquired infection, also known as HAI, an infection acquired by a patient as a result of a healthcare procedure that may or may not require a hospital stay. But definitely, there is a connection with a healthcare procedure. So, siguro, uh, pumunta siya somewhere, and then nagpa-surgery siya, or nagpa-check up lang siya, nakakuha siya ng sakit doon. And that is termed as healthcare acquired infection. So, if you can try to decipher the difference between the two, ang nosocomial talaga class is specified na sa hospital niyo po nakuha yung sakit. However, kapag healthcare acquired infection lang siya, nakuha niya yung sakit due to a healthcare procedure in anywhere other than the hospital. And of course, ha, huwag kakalimutan ang ating number one cause of nosocomial infection that is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a type of bacteria. Ito po yung pangalan ni bacteria na yun. Next, standard precautions for infection control. Standard precautions are work practices required to achieve a basic level of infection control. It is very vital for us medical technologists na mag-follow ng standard precautions because we are exposed to a lot of possible potential of infection. Okay? Sobrang daming uh, potential infectious agents sa paligid natin as medics. Kasi po tayo yung nagtitest nga eh, kung meron silang ganitong sakit or something like that. So it is vital for us na meron tayong work practices such as these standard precautions so that we may be able to protect ourselves. Then our standard precaution mainly include the hand hygiene, yung mga hand washing, pag-use ng alcohol, etc. We also have the use of gloves, the eye protection, the gown and mask, also hair net, pwede po. Those are our personal protective equipments or PPEs. We also have the prevention of needle stick injuries, so para hindi po tayo ma tusok ng needle na pwede natin gamitin. Example is yung ating mga syringe. We also be dealing with the respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. This is a uh, vital information for now since kasi talaga we are dealing with a virus that is transmitted mainly to the respiratory room. And we also have proper handling of linens in the hospitals or in the healthcare setting. Environmental cleaning and waste disposal and the proper use of patient care equipment. So, iisa-isahin po natin sila. Okay, hand hygiene or the proper hand washing. Pakitake note po, marami pong recall question dito po kay hand washing. O ba? Diba? very simple, just hand washing, lumalabas po yan lagi sa board exam. Kasi ito yung mga basic. So, hand contact is the primary method of transmission, infection transmission. So, ngayon po, uh, aside from inhalation of the respiratory droplets kay COVID-19, isa po sa mga main mode of transmission niya talaga is yung paghawak po sa contaminated fomite. Okay? Pwede natin sabihin din is through hand contact. Kasi po, what if si uh, COVID positive na patient bumahing siya or umubo siya? So, of course, magkakaroon niya ng mga droplet doon sa kanyang kamay. At nahawakan mo, example, yung kamay niya. O pwede ka na ngayon magkaroon ng COVID din. So, ingat-ingat po tayo natin. Then, we also have hand washing is the best way to break the chain of infection. Because since the primary method of infection transmission is hand contact, maghawak po sa kamay ng ibang tao, ngayon, para ma-break mo ngayon yung chain of infection, the best way to that is through hand washing. Then, please do take note of this. Ito po yung recall question sa ating board exam. When hands are visibly soiled, nakita mong madumi talaga siya, wash your hands with soap and water. But when hands are not visibly soiled, although malinis siya tignan, hindi siya visibly soiled, but feeling mo madumi na yung kamay mo talaga, apply a alcohol-based hand rubs, for example, is hand sanitizer. And I repeat, when hands are not visibly soiled, Use, you can use hand sanitizers. 
But still, the best way po talaga, especially during a pandemic, lalo na ngayon, hand washing po tayo with soap and water. But if soap and water is not readily available at yung kamay mo naman is not visibly soiled, you can use hand sanitizers or alcohols. Meron na namang malaking star. Di ba marami po talagang lumalabas sa board exam with regards to the hand washing. So here is uh, the hand washing procedure, pinaka basic, with hands with warm water. Apply antimicrobial soap such as yung mga safeguard or something like that. Basahin na lang. Basta mahalaga po, antimicrobial siya. Rub to form a ladder, create friction, and loosen debris. Number four is thoroughly clean between the fingers, including the thumbs, under the fingernails and rings, and up to the wrist for at least 15 to 20 seconds. Pakitake note po, ito po yung recall question. Hand washing procedure should be at least 15 to 20 seconds. I repeat, hand washing procedure should be at least 15 to 20 seconds. Please take note that is a recall question. Also, rinse hands in a downward position. I repeat, rinse your hands in a downward position. Paki take note po ulit. This is a recall question. So imagine nyo kasi kung pa-upward, pa di ba? Kung pa-upward yung position ng kamay nyo, di ba? Para ka namang kayo nagdadasal. So dapat po, pa-downward po sa sink yung ating position ng kamay during hand washing. Pakitake note po, recall question yan. Also, dry with a paper towel. So, huwag naman kasi basa, tas ipapahid nyo lang din kung saan. Ha? So, use a paper towel na lang. Then, turn off faucets with a clean paper towel to prevent recontamination. Meron naman kasi na iba, ang practice nila, pag naghuhugas sila ng kamay, naghuhugas nga. Kaso, nung tinurn off nila yung faucet, yung... Hindi <laughs> ko maalala kung na yung Tagalog ni faucet. But once they turn off the faucet, hinawak din naman nila dun sa faucet yung malinis na nilang kamay. So, it will be contaminated again. So, para po to prevent recontamination, kasi nga naghugas ka na nga ng kamay, turn off the faucets with a clean paper towel. Or pwede rin po somehow sa siko, no? And of course, don't forget the hand washing show. Hand washing song. Which is yung happy birthday twice. <laughs> Hindi ko na ilagay. Pakitake note po. Happy birthday. Two times. I repeat, don't forget the hand washing song that is happy birthday twice. Or two times. So, kakantahin nyo ng dalawang beses yung happy birthday. Pakitake note po. Recall question dun po yun. Moving on to the summary indications of hand hygiene. So, para saan ba talaga yan? So, before and after any direct patient contact and in between patients, whether gloves or worn. So, kung may gloves man kayo or wala, tapos hinawakan nyo si pasyente, any direct contact, hugas agad ng kamay. Immediately after gloves are removed. So, kung kahit nakagloves kayo, tapos humawak kayo ng pasyente, kahit sabihin yung nakagloves, right after you remove your gloves, you perform hand washing. Okay? Also, before handling an invasive device. Uh, this is vital po kasi kapag ang um, kamay nyo kasi madumi tapos hinawakan nyo po yung invasive device na yun. Then, kunwari na contaminate nyo yung device tapos papasok ngayon kasi yan sa katawan na pasyente. It can cause infection. So, dapat po maghugas ng kamay before handling an invasive device. Also, after touching blood, body fluids, secretions, excretions, non-intact skin, and contaminated items, even if gloves are worn. So, basta meron kayong nahawakan na kahit ano, lalong-lalo na yung ating mga body fluids, which are potentially infectious, even if you wear gloves or not, maghugas ng kamay din. Also, during patient care, when moving from a contaminated to a clean body site of the patient. So, what if naman class, um, kunwari yung paa, yung paa ni pasyente may in infection. Then, hinawakan mo yun kasi bibigyan mo siya ng ano eh, uh, service. So, hinawakan mo yun yung paa niya na may infection. Gagamitin mo ba yung same na kamay kahit nakagloves ka doon sa clean body part ng pasyente? Ayan ang, ang example niyan siguro, sige, yung kanyang kamay. So, hindi po dapat. Kapag po ganun, na uh, humawak kayo ng contaminated body part, even if it is the same patient, hahawak kayo sa ibang parte ng katawan niya na malinis naman at walang infection, you should wash your hands as well. 
Also, after contact with inanimate objects in the immediate vicinity of the patient. Kasi, what if nahawak-hawakan ni pasyente yun at meron yung mga droplets ng kung ano, pwede ka rin magkasakit. So, dapat po laging maghubas ng kamay. Okay, please do take note of this as well. Donning of the PPE. Donning meaning on. I repeat, donning on. Putting on. Okay, so para hindi marito kasi meron pa po tayong isa mamaya, yung doffing. But dito muna tayo kay donning or putting on. So, paano nyo po susu uh, susuotin yung ating mga personal protective equipments? Meron po yung tamang pagkakasunod-sunod. Please take note, this is a recall question. Ano daw po yung tamang pagkakasunod-sunod ng pagsuot ng ating personal protective equipment such as your gown, the mask or your respirator, goggles or face shield, tsaka yung gloves nyo. Ganito po ha ang pagkakasunod-sunod nyan. Una po dapat is your gown. The next one is your mask or respirator. Next is your goggles or a face shield. And then the last one is your gloves. I repeat. What is the proper donning of PPE? Putting on. Diba? Putting on. Donning. Para hindi kayo malito again. Donning. Putting on. Susuot pa lang natin. Gown. Mask or respirator. Goggles or face shield. Gloves. Again. Gown. Mask or respirator. Goggles or face shield. Gloves. That is the correct way on how to put on your PPE. Ano naman po yung next na doffing or fin. Diba ang fin ibig sabihin is end. So, doffing naman is yung pagtanggal naman po ng ating PPE. It can be like this. Magkasabay yung gloves tsaka yung gown. Goggles or face shield. And then the last one na dapat yung talagang tanggalin is the mask or the respirator. I repeat, gloves and gown, magkasabay, goggles or face shield, mask or respirator. Ito po yung pinaka huli nyo dapat tinatanggal. And this actually, this also applies class kapag kayo po ay lumalabas during ngayon, pandemic. So, kung kayo po ay lalabas, for example, mag sm kayo, magsasangyipsal, mga ganyan. So, kapag kayo po ay uuwi na sa bahay, you can actually perform this, it is like this. Okay, so tanggalin nyo muna yung damit nyo at ang pinakahuli nyo tatanggalin kapag galing kayo sa labas is yung mask nyo. Okay? Kasi what if ang ginawa nyo, inuna nyo yung mask tapos yung uh, damit nyo, di ba, galing kasi kayo sa labas. Pag nagtanggal kayo ng damit, right, is paangat. So, dadaan yan sa ulo nyo. E di tumama na ngayon yung uh, inyong damit sa mukha nyo, lalo na sa ilong nyo. Okay, so it is a good practice even hindi siya sa PPE. Maski yung mga normal lives natin na kapag kayo po ay galing ng labas, ang pinakahuli nyo dapat tatanggalin is yung mask or respirator. Okay, so that's just a good practice. So again, ito po yung donning of the PPE. Again, gown, mask or respirator, goggles or face shield, and then the last item is your gloves. Then, yung doffing po natin again, that is gloves and gown, pwede po magkasabay, goggles or face shield, mask or respirator as the last one. Preventing needle stick injuries. But mama, ano nga po pa ibig sabihin ng needle stick injuries? These are wounds caused due to puncturing of the skin by medical needles such as your hypodermic collection needles, sutures, and other needles used for intravenous IV catheter. So, yung mga ano po kasi natin, mga syringes po natin, yung injection, meron po mga needle yan, di ba? Yun yung itutusok natin kay patient. But, there are instances kapag hindi nyo namamalayan, matutusok kayo ng needle stick uh, or magkakaroon ng needle stick injuries. So, this is uh, very vital for you to know na dapat po prevent to because there are certain diseases po na kayang i-transmit sa inyo due to needle stick injuries lang. Imagine na ano lang kayo eh, na disgrasya lang kayo na tusok kayo nung karayom na tinusok nyo na sa pasyente. Eh what if yung pasyente na yun ay mayroong blood-borne disease, yung nakakahawa sa dugo? Pwede kayo magkaroon kapag kayo po ay natusok. So, preventing needle stick injuries. So, do not cover or unwrap the needles until it is time to use it. So, wag na lang tayo nagmamadali no, na 
hindi mo paggagamitin, binuksan mo na. So, dapat i-uncover niya lang po yung cap ng ating needle kapag po gagamitin na. Keep the need stick pointed away from yourself and other people at all times. So, dapat hindi siya nakaturo sa inyo, okay? Never recap or bend a needle. Then, keep your fingers away from the tip of the needle edge. Ito po kasi, class, yung madalas na nangyayari. Kapag masyado po malapit yung fingers nyo dun sa ating needle. Then, kapag kasi hindi nyo napansin, that's the time na matutusok kayo nyan. So, that's, that can be a possible source of infection. Also, dispose needle stick properly to closed containers after you use it. Make it a practice na kapag kayo po ay gumamit ng injection, yung needle, itapon nyo siya agad in a puncture-proof container. Then, tell the people you are working with when you plan to set needle stick down or pick it up. So, if in any case na hindi nyo na mahanap yung takip at kailangan nyo pa rin gamitin yung needle, sabihin nyo naman yung mga tao sa paligid nyo na huwag masyadong makulit. ba diba? Para hindi natin mag-cause ng injury sa atin at sa mga tao sa paligid natin. Okay. So, ito. Very timely to. Respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. Especially that the mode of transmission of COVID-19 is mainly through inhalation of respiratory droplets. Person with respiratory symptoms should apply source control measures. They should cover their nose and mouth when coughing or sneezing with tissue or mask. Dispose of tissues and mask and perform hand hygiene after contact with respiratory secretion. So, kung kayo po, even if you are if you are a known COVID-19 patient or not, or kahit hindi, basta respiratory po yung problema nyo na sakit, you should follow this. Okay? Kapag po kayo ay nagmamask, make sure po ha na yung mask nyo is nasa taas ng ilong nyo. Okay? Uh, wag, na, wag sana tayo nakakakita, lalo na sa ating mga medtechs, na yung mask natin is nasa baba ng ilong. Okay? So basically, yung mouth lang yung natatakpan. So mali po yun. Okay? So dapat po, ang tamang paggamit ng mask is lapat po siya sa mukha natin at nasa taas po siya ng ilong. It can cover our nose and mouth. Okay? And kung gagamit po kayo ng tissue and mask tapos nabahing kayo or inubo kayo, please dispose the tissue or the mask properly din. Kasi kawawa naman, na, naman po yung mga mag-aayos po nung ating mga waste. Sila naman yung pwedeng mahawaan. Kapag po hindi po natin din dispose ng maayos yung tissue na ginamit natin or yung face mask natin. Make it a habit class na magtulungan tayo na magprevent yung spread ng diseases, not just COVID-19. Also, of course, kung kunari wala kang tissue or mask, hindi mo na ano, uh, hindi mo na save, di ba? Inano mo agad is yung kamay mo. Kapag po there is a contact with respiratory secretions class, may kita habit po na maghugas agad ng kamay. Okay? Kasi kahit matuyo yan sa kamay nyo, kahit di nyo na siya nakikita, meron pa rin po yan. Kawawa naman yung mga Uh, vulnerable people na kasama natin in our environment if mahahawa sila sa inyo just because hindi kayo naghugas ng kamay. Okay. It is our moral responsibility for everyone to protect them and protect yourself. Okay, so ito din po, uh, paki, uh, take note na lang po ito. When you cough or sneeze, cover your nose and mouth with a tissue or cough or sneeze into your elbow, not your hand. Kasi nga po yung hands kasi natin kung saan-saan yan humahawak eh. Kaya po kayo, kunwari, walang readily available na tissue, cough into your elbows po, hindi po sa kamay. Okay? Then, hugasan mo rin naman agad. Then, this is something to do naman po with the healthcare facilities. Healthcare facilities should place acute febrile respiratory symptomatic patients at least 1 meter or 3 feet away from others in common waiting areas if possible. Yun nga po yung sinasabi natin, social distancing. At least 1 to 2 meters po yung dapat na layo natin with other people. So, kung kayo po ha, lumalabas po na kayo lagi, lalo na ngayon kasi di ba masaya eh, magpapas po kasi so masarap gumala. Make sure na lang class, lagi naka face mask, may baon na alcohol, panghugas ng kamay, and also, wag po kayo masyadong pumunta sa masyadong mataong, mataong lugar. Okay? Make it a habit na yung uh, katabi nyo dapat is 1 to 2 meters away from you. Okay? So, para ma-prevent na natin yung pag ng bagong surge ng COVID cases. Okay? Okay.
Okay, also, healthcare facilities should post visual alerts at the entrance to healthcare facilities instructing persons with respiratory symptoms to practice respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. So, pwede po yung mga healthcare facilities natin mag-post po sila ng parang mga flyers, parang ganon, or uh, common na alerts uh, na sinasabi itong mga ganito. Then, consider making hand hygiene resources, tissues, and masks available in common areas and are areas used for evaluation of patients with respiratory illnesses. So, ngayon naman is very common na to, right? Kahit saan ka pumunta, sa mga malls, kahit sa mga clinics, lagi pong readily available nyan yung hand hygiene resources natin. Unlike before pre-pandemic life. Minsan, kapag pupunta ka sa isang certain clinic, wala silang alcohol readily available, di ba? But ngayon, diretso yan, pagpunta nyo pa lang, pagpasok nyo pa lang, may alcohol na. Minsan, di ba, si guard pa yung nag-aalcohol sa mga kamay natin. Proper handling of linens. Uh, inside the hospitals or clinics po, of course, gumagamit po tayo ng linens, especially sa mga kama. Di ba, yung linens such as yung sa kumot, di ba, yung mga ganun, bed sheet. So, mga linens po yun. So, what is the proper handling of those uh, materials? Handling, transport, and process used linen in a manner in which it prevents skin and mucous membrane exposures and contamination of your clothing. So, katulad nito, meron po siyang mask, meron siyang hair net, at meron po siyang uh, gown. Meron pa din siyang gloves. So, kompleto siya lahat ng PPE niya. It is to prevent again, skin and mucous membrane exposure and contamination of your clothing to this linen. Kasi po, hindi po natin alam kung anong possible na sakit ang pwedeng nandito. Especially kapag infectious po yung ating pasyente. So, para maprotektahan natin ang ating sarili at yung mga tao sa paligid natin, start with yourself na ma-prevent yung contamination ng inyong mga bagay at yung exposure nyo doon sa mga possible sources of infection such as yung used linens po natin in the hospitals or clinic. Also, avoid transfer of pathogens to other patients and or the environment. So, kung kayo po ay na-assign dito, although mga medtech class, I highly doubt na gagawin nyo to, yung pag-ayos po ng linen sa hospital. But then again, if ever lang, if ever na napunta po kayo sa ganito, always avoid exposure po sa inyo talaga. Kasi kung kayo, hindi kayo nakahawa, of course, hindi rin kayo makakahawa sa mga tao sa paligid nyo. Okay, environmental cleaning and waste disposal. Use adequate procedures for the routine cleaning and disinfection of environmental and frequently touched surfaces, such as doorknobs, mga, basta yung mga madalas nyo hinahawakan, maski cellphone nyo. So, a good uh, routine here, lalo na po in the hospitals, in the clinics, ang ginagamit po talaga natin na ating disinfecting agent is 10% bleach. Maski po sa COVID class, this is the recommended disinfection agent or disinfecting agent. That is again 10% Clorox or bleach. That is 1 is to 10 na ratio. Okay, 10% bleach. So, basically, kung hunwari, 100 ml ang gagawin mo. So, 10 ml of the bleach and then 90 ml ng ating water. So, basta po dapat 10% po yung kanyang concentration. That is the best cleaning agent, not just for COVID-19, but on all uh, microorganisms po. 10% bleach. Very effective po yan. Okay. So, this is something to do naman with waste disposal. Ensure safe waste management. Treat waste contaminated with blood, body fluids, and secretions and excretions as clinical waste in accordance with local regulations. Human tissues and laboratory waste that is directly associated with specimen processing should also be treated as clinical waste. And of course, discard single-use items properly. So, hindi lang dapat basta-basta nagtatapon po, especially in the hospitals and laboratories. We are dealing with potential pathogens po at nakakahawa or pwedeng mag-cause ng infection with yourself and then the environment. So, make it a habit na dapat po we will ensure the safe waste management po, especially in the laboratory. And we are actually following a color coding scheme po sa ating mga 
health care facilities, not just in the laboratory. So this can be good for the whole hospital. So we are doing a color coding scheme na kung ito yung kulay ng bag, ng uh, waste, ito lang po yung mga pwede nyong ilagay. Pakitake note po ako nito ha, pakitake note po. Kapag kayo po ay nakakita sa hospital or a healthcare facility na color black yung kanyang bag, ang pwede nyo lang po ilagay dyan is non-infectious dry waste. I repeat, a color coding scheme, a black bag, you should only input here a non-infectious dry waste. For example, is unused paper. Okay? We can also have your green bag. Ito po. Yung ating green bag is for non-infectious wet waste. I repeat, the green bag is for non-infectious wet waste. A good example of this is yung leftover food. Yung leftover food po kasi natin, right, is basa. So, it is a good practice that the, those non-infectious wet waste should be discarded in a green colored bag. Ito po, take note, this is very vital, a yellow colored bag. Ito po, color yellow. Yellow uh, corresponds to infectious and pathological waste. I repeat, yellow, lalagay niyo po dyan, is infectious and pathological waste. So basically, since ang ating laboratory is very exposed to all of potential pathogens, we should always use yellow colored bag inside the laboratory. Okay? So, ayan na, hindi lang basta trip-trip ng mga manufacturer, yan glass, yung kulay niya. Meron po yung corresponding na waste category. Okay? Pina-follow po yan. Very strict po ang ating mga hospitals when it comes to waste management. What about the yellow with the black band? That is for chemical and heavy metal waste. Color orange po, ganito, is for radioactive waste. And yung color red po is for our sharps and pressured containers. So, such as this one. Dapat po ang ating mga sharps containers should be puncture-proof. Hindi po yan dapat uh, natutusok. Or hindi siya dapat kayang tusukan. Unlike kasi ng mga bags natin. Sige, pag lagay nyo dyan ng sharp na bagay, masisira yung bag. But for this, for the sharps container, dapat po puncture proof siya. Healthcare waste disposal notes. So these are just additional notes. Phlebotomy equipment and supplies contaminated with blood and other body fluids must be disposed of in a container clearly marked with the biohazard symbol or red or yellow coding. So such as this. This is the biohazard symbol. Urine can be poured out in the laboratory sink. So, ito po yung typical na dalagyan po ng ating urine na ipaprocess in the laboratory. So, you can actually pour it down the sink. We can also do contaminated and non-disposable equipment. Blood spills and blood and other body fluid processing areas must be disinfected using a one is 10 dilution of sodium hypochlorite, yung 10% bleach nga po yun. Allow the disinfectant to air dry. Then, the sharps should be disposed of in a sharps container to prevent exposure to blood and sharp objects such as needles because of this blood-borne pathogen. So, kung kayo nga po ay uh, natusok po kayo ng needle, for example, hindi nyo sinasadya, natusok kayo. These are the possible blood-borne pathogens na pwede nyo pong makuha. Kaya po dapat mag-ingat kayo sa needle stick injuries. Hepatitis B, Hepatitis C, and HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, can be transmitted through needle stick injuries. Kaya po mag-ingat po ha sa mga sharps natin that you will use for phlebotomy. The proper use of patient care equipment. Handle equipment soiled with blood, body fluids, secretions, and excretions in a manner that prevents skin and mucous membrane exposures, contamination of clothing, and transfer of pathogens to other patients or the environment. Clean, disinfect, and reprocess reusable equipment appropriately before use with another patient. A good example of this class, ang isa sa mga napapansin ko na... Hindi lang sa mga students, kundi pati sa mga medtechs talaga na veterano na. Is sometimes they are forgetting to disinfect this mga equipment. Yung patient care equipments natin such as your pambiti, blood pressure monitor, tsaka yung tourniquet na ginagamit kapag nagpa, nagpa blood collection. 
So kayo po dapat class masanay po kayo na kada gamit nyo sa isang pasyente ng mga patient care equipment natin such as the blood pressure monitoring machine. So kayong tourniquet po, i-disinfect nyo po siya bago nyo siya igamit sa ibang pasyente. Okay? So yung BP monitor na pwede ma alcohol yan. Uh, then, i-disinfect nyo muna siya please bago nyo po siya gamitin sa ibang pasyente. That is a good practice. Lalong-lalo na po class yung tourniquet. Uh, minsan nakaka-isang daang tao na hindi pa dinidisinfect. So, ako kami, nung friend ko, habit talaga namin, kada gamit namin ng tourniquet, since hindi kasi siya disposable, so, kada gamit sa isang tao, alcohol, disinfect, bago namin siya ilalagay sa isang pasyente na naman. So, make that a habit. Okay, to prevent contamination and yung transmission po ng ating mga diseases, i-disinfect nyo po po na siya at linisin bago nyo po siya gamitin sa ibang tao. Regardless kung may sakit man o wala yung taong yun, hindi nyo yan masasabi. So, dapat i-disinfect talaga mo. Transmission-based precautions, classification. The first type here is your airborne transmission. Possible conditions uh, for airborne is your tuberculosis, measles, chicken pox, herpes, zos, herpes zoster, shingles, mumps, mumps po is peke, adenovirus. So, PPE po na dapat suotin natin for airborne transmission based na mga condition is your standard precautions, mask or respirator. Then, for the droplets naman, a good example of possible condition with droplet transmission is COVID-19. Then, also infection with Neisseria meningitidis, hemophilus, pertussis, whooping cough, group A, streptococcus, influenza, rhinovirus, scarlet fever, parvovirus B19, respiratory syncytial virus, and diphtheria. Then, the PPE po na pwede natin gamitin dyan is our mask and, of course, standard precautions as well. Then, contact. Clostridium difficile. This is a type of bacteria. Rotavirus, a draining wound, antibiotic-resistant infections, cabis, impetigo, herpes simplex, respiratory syncytial virus, and herpes zoster. PPE po na pwede natin gamitin dyan is, of course, the gown and gloves and, of course, follow your standard precautions. Okay, next po natin here is the isolation versus reverse isolation. I'm sure now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you have heard the term isolation. So, ano nga po ba talaga ang ibig sabihin ng isolation? And I, what is isolation? A diagnosis of COVID-19 triggers isolation. Isolation is for those who are already sick. So basically, may sakit sila. And serves to keep infected away from healthy people in order to stop the spread of the virus. So kumbaga, pag sinabi po natin isolation, ina-isolate po natin si pasyente para maprotektahan tayong mga healthy na individual. Okay, I repeat, pag sinabi po natin isolation, ina-isolate natin si pasyente para maprotektahan po tayong mga healthy na people. So, para hindi tayo ma-expose sa kanya. So, ganun po yung isolation. So, ano naman po ngayon, ma'am, yung protective or the reverse isolation? The reverse isolation is used to protect certain patients from microbes in the environment. Ito naman po, baliktad. Ginagawa ang reverse isolation para protektahan naman natin ngayon yung pasyente from us. Okay? Unlike, di ba, kay isolation again. Pag sinabing isolation, pinoprotektahan natin tayo dun sa may sakit. Okay? Pag sinabi pong protective or reverse isolation, ang pinoprotektahan na ngayon is yung pasyente natin. Okay? This is mainly for immunocompromised patients, burn patients, ayan, Madalas to class dun sa mga burn patients natin, yung mga nasunog. Then, bone marrow transplant and for those people experiencing AIDS, they are uh, undergoing reverse isolation para maprotektahan natin yung pasyente from us. Kasi baka kasi tayo naman yung magdala ng sakit sa kanya. At like isolation, si pasyente ang magdadala ng sakit natin. You get my point? So, baliktad po sila. The patient is placed in a room that has been disinfected and frequent disinfection occurs while the patient is in the room. Anyone who enters the room must wear the gown, the gloves, and the mask. Kasi nga po, pinoprotektahan natin yung pasyente natin through 
through reverse isolation. Good example talaga niyan, Tila, yung mga burn patients natin. So, kunwari, nasunog yung bahay, ganun, tapos nasunog yung tao, then nabuhay pa siya, miraculously, they should be inputted under reverse isolation. Para hindi po natin uh, sila mahawaan ng kung ano mang sakit. Okay, so we are now done with the biological hazards. Next, we have your chemical hazards in the laboratory. Phlebotomists may come in contact with chemicals while accessioning or processing samples in the lab and preparing containers for urine samples that require preservatives or chemicals. General rules for safe handling of chemicals include taking precautions to avoid chemicals on the body, clothes, and work area, wearing personal protective equipment such as safety goggles when pouring chemicals, Observing strict labeling practices, so dapat binabasa po natin yung label ng chemical na yun. And of course, carefully following the instructions on how to use that specific chemical. All chemicals and reagents containing hazardous ingredients in a concentration greater than 1% are required to have a material safety data sheet, also known as your MSDS, on file in the work area. So, any chemical po na gagamitin nyo, reagents, mga kung ano-anong preservatives, should have a material safety data sheet. Yung MSDS na yun can indicate the potential hazard of that specific chemical as well as kung paano po siya gagamitin in a right way. So, kumbaga parang manual to ng mga chemicals natin, yung material safety data sheet or MSDS. Okay, please do take note of this as well. This is a common recall question in the board exam. The chemical hazard identification system. So, yung mga chemicals po natin, makakakita kayo sa MSDS ng ganito. Para siyang diamond. So, that is actually known as the chemical hazard identification system. Ma'am, ano po ang recall question dito? Ang recall question dito, class, is ano pong kulay yung health hazard? And the answer to that, of course, is color blue. But meron pa tayo kasi fire hazard, instability, and specific hazard. Paano ko po, ma'am, kakabisaduhin kung ano pong kulay yan? Ganito po. Please remember the phrase, you were born right. I repeat, please remember the phrase, you were born right. U for yellow, letter Y, were, W or white, blue, born, and yung right is letter R, red. Ganito po. Start here. In the instability, dun sa ating pinaka right side, you were born right. Again, you were born right. Okay, again, I repeat, please remember the phrase, you were born right. Oo naman, no? Ano tayo talaga? Pinanganak tayo na tama tayo. Hindi tayo isang pagkakamali. We are right. You were born right. So again, that is a yellow, white, blue, red. Specifically po, ang tinanong na before is what is the color of your health hazard? Again, that is color blue. And then, the instability, balik tayo kay U, letter uh, Y, or yellow, that is for instability. We also have our uh, specific hazard, which is color white. Again, health hazard is color blue. Please do take note, a recall question. And the fire hazard po is color red. And also, please do take note the degree of hazards or the hazards index. Please remember the phrase here, no SMS excess. I repeat, please remember the phrase, no SMS excess. Oy ha, huwag natin tinatext ang ating mga text. Ang ating mga X, okay? No SMS excess kasi hazard po yan kapag tayo ay nag-text sa mga X natin. So, no SMS excess. Ano po yung sabihin ng no SMS excess, ma'am? Aside sa bawal akong mag-text sa X po. That is the degree of hazards of the different chemicals. There is a specific rating system here that is starting with zero. That is zero, one, two, three, four. Pakitake note po, merong malaking star here. This is also a recall question in the board. No SMS excess stands for zero or no to minimal hazard. One is light hazard. Two is moderate hazard. Three is serious hazard. 
And 4 is extreme or severe hazard. I repeat that is no SMS excess. Please start with zero. No minimal, slight, moderate, serious, extreme, or severe. I repeat no, slight, moderate, serious, extreme, or severe. That is the no SMS excess. The a phrase that we will remember to check for the degree of hazard or the hazard index. Please take note ha, mag-start po tayo dito sa zero. Okay, so let's try to identify. So, di ba, kinabisado na si you were born right. Kinabisado na rin natin si no SMS X. O ano ibig sabihin na ito ngayon? Pag nakakita ka ngayon sa laboratory. Let's try to identify the danger of acetic anhydride. So, here is the chemical hazard identification system, yung diamond. Then, meron ka nakita dito, this is yellow. Ano nga po ulit yung yellow? That is yellow instability. What about the color white? That is specific hazard. What about color blue? That is health hazard. What about the color red? That is fire hazard. So, using the uh, chemical hazard identification system, tsaka yung degree of hazard index. So, 2. Ano nga ulit yung 2? No SMS excess. What is 2? That is moderate. What about 3? That is serious. So basically, ang sinasabi natin dito kay acetic anhydride, ang kanyang instability hazard is only moderate. And also yung fire hazard niya is also moderate. However, yung health hazard po ni acetic anhydride is a serious one. Kasi ba degree hazard of 3. And ano po ito? Sige. Pwede nyo tignan dito yan kay Chemical Hazard Identification System. Aside po dun sa kulay, dapat alam nyo kung para saan siya. Ito pong mga grading systems nyo rin should be memorized. So, in this, in this case, since the instability, number 2, that is a violent chemical change may happen. And also denotes again a moderate hazard. What about the specific hazard na kalagay is core, C-O-R. Core is for corrosive. So, ayan po. What about the health hazard? Diba? 3. A health hazard of 3 is a serious one and it denotes an extreme danger. Itong acetic anhydride na to can pose an extreme danger to our health. And what about the fire hazard which is a fire hazard of 2 which is also a moderate one that is below 200 degree Fahrenheit flash point. So, that is how you will use the chemical hazard identification system in a specific chemical found in the laboratory. So, di ba dapat naiintindihan kasi natin eh? Like, what if makakita ka nito? O para, para saan ba yan? Di ba? Ano yung sinasabi niya? So, dapat naiintindihan natin siya. And ganun nga po yung example ng how to interpret this hazard identification system. Also, next natin here, aside from the chemical hazard, we can also encounter electrical hazard in the laboratory. So, when drawing blood or performing other procedures, phlebotomy should avoid contact with electrical equipment in the patient's room because current from improperly grounded equipment can pass through the phlebotomist and the metal needle to the patient. So, dapat layo-layo uh, po tayo dun sa mga electrical sources natin. And then, please take note, may recall question din po dito. Simple lang naman yung recall question. Ano daw po ang gagawin nyo kapag nagkaroon ng electrical hazard or electrical shock or a certain machine merong uh, nagkaroon ng hazard when it comes to its electricity? So, what you will do again when a situation involving electrical shock occurs, the first thing that you need to do is hindi po tumakbo palabas ng room. Okay? The first thing that you should do once an electrical shock or electrical hazard occur, turn off the source or the circuit breaker. I repeat, the first thing that you should do if there is a electrical hazard that is happening in your environment, 
first thing that you should do, turn off the source or turn off the circuit breaker immediately. Okay? Huwag kayong tatakbo agad-agad kasi kawawa naman kung may ibang tao doon. Kayo ang nakakaalam kung saan nakasaksak. Itong mga ito, uh, baka alam nyo rin kung nasa yung circuit breaker, turn off the source immediately. That is the recall question in the boarding deck. Also, physical hazards naman. General precautions that phlebotomy should observe include, number one, avoid running in rooms or hallways. So, baka kasi madapa-dapa pa tayo, tapos may dala-dala tayong dugo, matatapon yung dugo at it can be a potential source of infection to us and the people around us. Also, be alert for wet floors. Bend the knees when lifting heavy objects or your patients. Kasi baka kayo naman po, biglang mapitikan kayo dyan. <laughs> yung likod nyo pumitik naman bigla kasi masyadong mabigat yung binungkat. Also, keep long hair tied back and remove dangling jewelry to avoid contact with equipment and patients. Baka naman kayo ay naghihikaw nung sobrang haba. Yan, tumama-tama na doon sa pasyente natin yan. What if may nakakahawang sakit pala? May nahawa na kayo. Also, wear comfortable closed toe shoes with non-skid soles that provide maximum support because inside the laboratory class, most of the time, nakatayo po tayo. So, for us to be comfortable enough at hindi tayo magkaroon ng chronic condition when it comes sa ating paa kasi lagi tayo nakatayo, please, uh, mag, ano tayo, uh, mag- so tayo ng comfortable na shoes at dapat closed toe siya. Hindi po pwedeng nakachinyela sa laboratory. Okay? Then, also maintain a clean and of course a organized work area to prevent disasters from happening. And pakitake note po ako, these are the common hazard symbols that can be seen inside the laboratory. Dapat po, alam nyo po lahat yan na kapag nakakita kayo ko, for example, ng ganito, ng ganyan, ganito, ganito, alam nyo yung ibig niyang sabihin. Okay? Ang malagang tandaan dito is, lalo na itong mga nasa baba. Itong mga nasa baba. Radioactive, ganito po siya. Radioactive, madalas to class sa mga x-ray po. Radioactive po yun. A biohazard symbol is commonly seen in the laboratory because all, almost all of the materials that can be found inside the lab are biohazards can be a potential source of infection. So, meron po mga students kasi class na nalilito doon sa difference ni radioactive from biohazard. Kasi parehas silang may tatlo. Ayan, di ba? Parang tatlong rings. However po, the main difference of this is yung ating biohazard symbol contains three rings and then a middle ring. Unlike the radioactive na biohazard, mukha siyang electric fan. <laughs> Ayan, di ba? Mukha siyang electric fan. Yung LEC ng electric fan. Di ba? Then, yung biohazard again, may tatlong ring, tapos may isa pang ring sa gitna. So, huwag niyo pong pagpapalitin ang radioactive at biohazard. Although, medyo somehow similar ang kanilang itsura, it pertains to a very, very different hazard po. At meron pa pong isang recall question here that is, yung ating poison or toxic. Ayan. Poison or toxic. Please take note, this is a previous recall question in the board exam. The question there is, what is the hazard denoting a, a skull and two crossbones? I repeat, a skull. Skull yan, di ba? Skull and two crossbones. A skull and two crossbones denote a toxic or a poison. So, that is the recall question in the board exam. Please take note of that. Okay, ayan ang daming star, di ba? Apat yung nilagay ko kasi po, nung uh, time ko, siguro mga five times tinanong to. Healthcare fire safety. There are four essential steps to take if you discover a fire. Especially, eto po. Rescue, alarm, contain, extinguish. The recall question in the board exam, what does R stand for? Okay, dun sa acronym na RACE. What does R stand for? Stand for? That is again, rescue. <laughs> Natatawa ko right now kasi madalas ang sinasagot ng mga students sobrang pressured sa board exam is run. So, tumakbo daw. <laughs> but, according to the healthcare fire safety, dapat po, race, letter R is rescue. I repeat, 
R is rescue, ha? Hindi po run. Uh, sasabunod ako talaga yung sasagot ng run dun sa ating race. <laughs> Again, ang R po natin is rescue. I repeat, R, rescue, R, rescue. Then again, um, for essential steps, if you discover a fire, please remember race, that is rescue, alarm, contain, extinguish. Okay? Also, how to properly operate a fire extinguisher? Please remember the term PASS. I repeat, please remember the term PASS. PASS for P for pull, A for aim, S is squeeze, and last S is sweep. We call the question din po ito. So again, how do you properly operate a fire extinguisher? Please remember PASS. Pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. Pakitake note po, lagi pong lumalabas yan sa board exam. Nung time ko nga mga 5 times ata. Di ba? Ang dali-dali lang, oh. Ano ang ibig sabihin ng letter R sa, re sa race? Ganun lang. So, for the left, very, very basic. But definitely can aid you na pumasa. Okay, we also have the different types of fire. So, we also have different classes here. Type A, or class A, class B, class C, class D, and class K. Class A is for ordinary combustible such as wood and paper, clothing, etc. Class B, tinatandaan ko po dito, is B for basa. As in B for basa or liquid. Flammable liquids such as grease, oil, paints, and solvents. Those are under class B for, again I repeat, B for basa, liquid. Also, we also have class C or the, uh, for the... Live electrical equipment, ang tinatandaan ko po dito, class C for kuryente. <laughs> Letter C, kuryente. Ayan, di ba? So, that is for live electrical equipment such as electrical panels, mo motor, wiring, etc. And class D for dog is for combustible metal such as magnesium and aluminum. And class K po is for kusina, commercial cooking equipment. Letter K for kusina. Cooking oils, animal fats, vegetable oils, all or under class K. So, yun. That can be a way for you, class, para hindi kayo malito kung ano yung mga materials. Again, B for basa, C for current or kuryente, at letter K for kusina. <laughs> Commercial cooking equipment. Okay, so aside po, class, that there are Compositions po ng different uh, fire classes natin. Meron din pong different types of fire extinguisher that is vital na pwede nyo gamitin to extinguish these fires na, that is coming from these types of classes. A good example, kapag po ang uh, main composition ng fire natin is wood, paper, or clothing, you should also use type A, ext fire extinguisher, which is ang extinguishing material po niyan is mainly water. And also, class B fire, yung basa, liquid flammables. Ang um, type of extinguisher po niyan is also class B. Then, ang um, extinguishing materials that is possible for class B fires is dry chemicals, carbon, dioxide, foam, or halon. Please take note po, the recall question here is yung uh, foam. Yung foam po na extinguishing material is for class B. Okay, then class C, mga electrical currents. Then, class C then po ang uh, types of fire extinguisher. Then, that is for dry chemicals, carbon dioxide, or halon is possible to extinguish class C fires. Class D are combustible materials. Ang types of fire extinguisher na pwede po dito is class A, B, and C. So, lahat pwede. Ang um, pwede dyan is dry chemicals or sand or dry powder. And last one, class K, kusina, grease, oils, fats, Types of fire extinguisher here is class K as well. And extinguishing material that can be used is liquid designed to prevent flashing and cooling the fire. And again, please take note ha, yung foam po natin, yung kakaiba dito. Because si foam lumabas na po sa board exam before. And again, si foam is responsible for extinguishing class B materials. B for basa, like liquid flammable. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or clarifications, you may email me through this email.